Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Zadell. I'm a doctoral student in the music technology department across the street. I'm studying with uh, Gary Scavone and Marcella Wanderly. And today I have the pleasure, uh, and I'm also the Kermit Access to, one of the Kermit Access to uh, student representatives. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our second keynote speaker, Miller Puckett. Um, he's currently the chairman of the music department at the University of California, San Diego. Um, while working at IRCAM in the late 80s, he developed the Max real-time visual programming environment. Um, and most of us, as most of us here know, Max went on to be, to be hugely in influential in the computer music, digital arts, and research communities, helping non-programmers easily develop interactive computer works. Uh, he later wrote and continues to work on Pure Data, an open source reimagining of the Max paradigm, uh, which has developed a large and vibrant following of digital arts and computer music practitioners. Uh, the, uh, the, Kermit, excuse me, the Kermit Student Exchange Committee, um, Student Exec Committee, voted uh, to invite Dr. Puckett to speak today for his important contributions in the history of computer music tools and his unique perspective on the field. Please join me in welcoming Miller Puckett. Thanks. and. Um I'm just going to apologize for being so late. Uh, I'm on a jury upstairs, which hasn't even finished, but I just sort of cut out in order to <laughs> sort of split the difference here somehow. Um, the, the thing that I'm going to try to talk about is the stuff that I know about, which actually does not connect in a very strong way with much of the work that I've seen today. Um, to say it in one of many possible ways, um, that music and science have a funny relationship, uh, which is perhaps typified by the fact that science, as a, at least empirical science, is, is largely about trying to find commonalities or underlying principles or universals in things. And of course, what makes a piece of music what it is, is how it's different from every other piece of music. It's not interesting in that it's the same as all the other pieces of music. Um, so to make music in some way, you have to, to escape from the structure of science and, and go somewhere else. That's not to say that music is pure creativity. Uh, music, of course, exists in its, in its um, context, which is, an, uh, which is a cultural context, and can't exist without it because you can't listen to a piece of music without you know, having a notion of what music is somehow. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, Although you can find similarities in, uh, you, you know, in musical practice across, um, across different pieces of music, arguably knowing what those similarities are doesn't actually help you make a new piece of music in any, in any way that I can put my finger on anyhow. Um, and this, this sort of, uh, this, is, this, this tension between what science does and what music does uh, sort of comes to the fore when you start doing electronic music because of course electronic music uses the results of science and of engineering in order to build, in order to make tools available for, um, for making music. So to, to describe what I do for a living, uh, I don't study music, I make tools for making music. And furthermore, I don't teach people or at least I do a bad job of teaching people who are trying to, to do scientific experiments about music, and to the extent that I do a good job at all, it's in helping people actually uh, uh, realize musical ideas, either, either as pieces of music or as, as uh, methodologies for going about trying to make music. And then I guess that's a kind of disclaimer. Um, that's not to say that I think that, uh, I think that making music is a higher um, calling than uh, doing science, I'm not sure which is the higher calling. I wouldn't try to order them, uh, but only to say that I'm actually a lousy scientist, and so those of you whose uh, interest is primarily scientific should think of me as an oddball and should throw me out of your data set. <laughs> which is... <laughs> um, now, the, so the, the next thing, the next disclaimer that I want to make, this, this might actually end up being about an hour's worth of disclaimers without saying anything at all, but the, the second disclaimer th is this. Um, I don't think that what I can tell you about making music software is going to be useful to you in the slightest, because um, I'm a person who has made and makes music software, and yet the 
the situation when I started making music software, it was so different from what the situation is today that to the extent that I can tell you anything useful at all, it's, it's, uh, how, it's how the things that I did would no longer actually be suitable things to do today. And, and in fact, that's what I tell my students. Um, uh, the, the last thing that you should try to do right now uh, to, be, to, be, to, to help the, the world of, of computer music make better computer music in some way, the last thing you should do is make a, a software environment, um, right? Maybe that's obvious. Um, why is that the last thing you should do? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a couple of specific reasons later on. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a general thing right now, which is that... Um, the, 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 the way technology seems to move in time um, is, is not what they say, which is that, oh, everything is just constantly changing all the time. That's, that's not really true insofar as, at least that's not my experience. What happens is that things solidify, and then they're stuck there forever, never changing again, never to change again. You know, the QWERTY keyboard is the great example of this. And what changes is that other stuff gets piled on top of it, right? And so, for instance, you know, the, the keyboard, mouse, uh, window, blah, 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 blah. It's, it, it has all of its, har all these horrible deficiencies and, every, and there are all sorts of things that one should change about it, but it won't change. It's just going to be what it is. And if you want to change that, what you will do, if you're going to be successful, is to do something either, um, that would either go alongside it or else would operate on a different level entirely from it. And that's what I mean by saying don't make software environments. Um, it hasn't been a good decade for adoption of new software environments uh, because there seem to be an adequate number of them so that there aren't enough holes between the, what the ones that exist can do to, to stick another one in there, ecologically speaking. There, there's no niche that's open that I can detect. But things that happen at different levels in the, in the discourse, that's to say different, um, different approaches to algorithmic composition, which, don't, which are not the same thing as software environments. They would be things like well, you know, AI or something like that, or things that operate at a at a um, at a more um, what's the right word? at a more insular no at a more atomic level like uh, like plugins. Uh, those are things that one can can successfully make now and, and fill niches that are big enough for something to actually uh, be of some significance. All right. So uh, and of course I'm committing a horrible rhetorical uh, error, jumping to a conclusion before making the argument which I'm going to try to make. So, <clears throat> so the argument is, is something long, well, there's no argument. The, 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 um, the, the, the abstract to the talk has, has three main headings, that, which are just sort of things that I want to try to shed light on to the extent that I can, uh, which, is what, um, which is how you might think about the, um, the, the way computers either help or hinder people who are trying to make uh, music or even the way electronics seems to be um, uh, working its way into the music making process, which of course you know is the great story of the last century in music is the fact that electronics arrived and, and things uh, changed in very interesting ways. Um, so what um, so so what really has changed? And one way of thinking about what's, what what electronics is doing is is thinking about what you're doing when you're making electronic music, which to me. Um, divides into the three things which I managed to articulate well enough to write into the abstract. One of them is, uh, oh, well, uh, music is performance. So how, um, so how do you want to see electronics um, as being a thing which, um, uh, which becomes a part of a music performance? In what ways does that uh, in increase or change the capa your capabilities as a performer? Um, that's, that's thing number one. Thing number two is, is the thing that David Ziccarelli pointed out, which is that, um, 90% of the time when you're making computer music, you're really doing office work, right? Computers are things which are designed for, um, for uh, financial transactions and ledgers, and also they're designed for making missile trajectories. They're calculating missile trajectories, right? The, the computer on the boat in World War II, all that stuff, right? They are not things that were ever designed to make music, and in fact, um, many of us were born in a time when music, when computers didn't have speakers and microphones, right? That's a... That's a that's a recent development that you would think of a computer as a thing which would, uh, which would actually be something that participates in media, right? What computers did in, in, uh, when they were designed was crunch numbers. What they do awfully well is crunch numbers. What they do only as a sort of uh, what a side you know sidetrack is um, is accept 
uh, manipulate and, and, and produce sounds, uh, which, which can be, among other things, useful for music. Right? Um, so so when, you're, when you're doing computer music, if you just look at how the time all got, you know, all vanished, uh, most of it was not actually spent uh, making music. Most of it was spent doing office work. And that has, uh, thinking about that, thinking about how uh, music making works as a process, uh, yeah. seems to me to have uh, profound implications on how you want to think about how, you want, uh, about how the computer should be part of your music making life, right? The third thing is that, um, the, the third aspect, which is frequently just sort of left for later, but uh, is important, is, uh, is the question of what are you, what's the thing that you're going to end up with? So um, the Western musical tradition is, is sort of caught up in this idea that you, that you make works of, of music which actually have a life that isn't just the fact that you performed a piece once or performed music once, but that uh, there's, there's a thing there which you would like to have around so that you can do it again. Um, why? Well, we get into lar long and, and tedious arguments about you know the the relationship between the 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 record of music and, and the live practice of music, which uh, which I think are not tedious at all. They're very interesting, but no time for that right now, I don't think. But um, but there's there, there does seem to be a sense that um, or some people at least will say, you know, uh, I've got this piece that I would like to be able to play 10 years from now, or I've got this piece and it works in my studio and I'd like it to work on stage, or I've got this piece and it's on a Macintosh but I want it to work on a PC, or, or I've, uh, there's this wonderful piece that Stockhausen wrote in 1970-something and, and, uh, and my artistic director just programmed it, so where do I get the patch? Or, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff, which I think is, um, you know, it, 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 it lies along a different axis from the, other, from the first two questions, which are basically about work. That one's about, um, you know, what, what is a piece of music and, and what aspect of it can a computer help you reify, if that's the right word. Um, so, those are, so those are the three sort of axes along which I want to try to, uh, try to shed light. And that doesn't make any sense. And, um, and then I... Uh, while, while thinking about that, no, let's just skip that. I was going to list a bunch of interesting software, uh, well, things that, that happened in computer music recently, but I think I'll just sort of do that as they come up. Um, and the next thing, and here I, I might actually insult everyone's intelligence all at once, which will be an accomplishment. Um, the, so, so, to, so to go back to the question of what, okay, so the three things are what happens on stage, what do you do in your office, and, and, and how do you interoperate with, with other things and with yourself in other periods of time and so on like that. And the first thing, which is, you know, what is the role of electronics in performance, is sort of the obvious, is the most obvious part of the, of the issue, or at least is the most obvious to me. Because if you believe, as I do, that, uh, that music is, is in the making, then... Uh, the real issue is, you know, how does the computer act as a musical instrument, or or does it act as a musical instrument? Does it act, uh, for instance, alternatively as a as a as a as a separate intelligence, or as a real time composer, or as a um, as a studio, or something else? Right? There, there, there. You know, what's what's going to be the role of 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 the electronics to try to. To try to not describe it as an object, but as a but as an aspect, uh, what what's going to be the role of electronics in your performance? And then perhaps a way to answer that is, well, what is it that you would like to be able to do that you can't do with with a banjo, to s or or whatever it might be that you that you have that doesn't use electricity? And that in the 1980s when I got started seemed absolutely obvious, and now that I think about it again, it seems quite opaque. So I'll see if I can make it seem obvious, and then I'll see if I can make it seem opaque. And if I can do that, then I'll have scored a rhetorical point. So the obvious thing is this. A computer is able to uh, create any sound that you can possibly get to come out of a speaker, right? As, as I forget who first said, said it that way, but that's a good way to describe it. And I can prove it, because if you want to make a second of sound, all you've got to do is get your text editor out and enter 44,100 numbers, and out will come a second of sound, right? And then you repeat that uh, 600 times, and you got a 10-minute piece. No problem, right? And you can make any 10-minute uh, one-channel piece, well, you know, 
And then again, for each speaker, you do the same thing, right? You could make any piece of, of, of thing, of stuff that the speaker could possibly emit down to things that you wouldn't be able to detect the difference of, perceive the difference between, right? Okay, now that's, right. And so what that makes it seem is that all we gotta do is have the good software that, that sort of helps you get to the good bits of, 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 of 10 minute stuff in a shorter amount of time. In other words, it's a mere question of efficiency at this point. And if you could just write a wonderful computer music environment, which I just told you you better not do, then, um, then you've solved the problem of computer music. You've made the computer uh, completely available as, as, as an instrument. Um, okay, so that was, you know, that was the sort of, that was the thing that drew me into the field was the idea, oh man, you know, I could, I don't have to sound like those, those instruments over there. I can just invent any sound that I want to. It's limited only by my imagination and this is obviously the great new frontier for music. Okay, so now the negative point of view is this. Every, okay, going back to the idea of typing in the, the numbers by hand. Um, when you get right down to it, every single uh, computer music application or environment pretty much is capable of exactly the same possible set of outputs. So what really differs between, say, s mm, this is going to be false, but I'll say it anyway, and I'll tell you later why it's false if I can remember. Um, so, so the difference between C sound, Super Collider, PD, um, Audacity, whatever it is, is not that they are capable of making different sounds, but that the efficiency by which they would make one subset of the set of possible sounds might be different from each other. Or to put it another way, how many sounds could you make in, uh, in a month's work? What can you do in a month? Well, maybe you can, maybe you can emit about a bit a second of, of useful information, right? So a month is however, however many seconds there are in a month, that's that many bits of information. You've got that in a file, that's your input file, and, and now you're going to put that in, this is Alan Turing think, right? And then you're gonna put that through your machine or whatever this, the environment is that you've set up uh, as input and then out, out comes your 10 minutes of sound. And now the question is, what would the thing in, in between be so that with that fixed bit length of input that the composer would be able to cough up in that month of work, um, what, what would be the greatest possible variety or the most useful possible variety of possible th of things that could come out of the speaker, the, lo the loudspeaker, I mean, not the me speaker. Um, and if you think about that, it's it starts to sound uh, what's the right word um, anti-utopian, because what that suggests is that um, no matter what you do as a software developer, you are you are essentially cutting off not ninety percent of the possible things that your computer could do and not 99.9% .9 of the possibilities, but actually 99 point, and then I'm not sure how many nines it would be, that would describe the little tiny slice that your measly, whatever, megabit of information uh, uh, carves out in the, in the entire set of possible sounds that a person could listen to. Okay, that <laughs> that's a daunting idea because that suggests that, well, what does that suggest? To me, that makes me think e ecologically again. Because now, um, of course, as a person like me who is interested in making computer music tools, and never mind what on earth my motivation might have been to do that to start out with, um, there are people like me and there are people who are musicians, who are, say, composers. And it might be the case that I would be better at writing software than, say, Philippe Mannery, and it might be the case that he's a much better composer than me, so it would make sense that we should team up. But in some sense, that means that I'm right there between the client and the loudspeaker, which is a, which is an un, what's the right word, an unsuitable amount of power to give someone. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm, I'm actually operating as a, as a sensor. <laughs> this is bad. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a role I want to play. Or, and, and here's the uh, soothing, counter, um, contradicting thought. Maybe, in fact, that's not the way the ecology works at all. Maybe the truth is there are about a thousand people like me, and, uh, and there's only one person like Philippe, and he just blew off the other 999 of them because they weren't doing things that corresponded well to what he was interested in. So, in fact, he's the, he's the unit, and I'm the replaceable cog in the machine. Which, which of those is the truth? I don't know. 
um, or actually, the, the, the real truth is that both of those things were described in causal language. And as good scientists, you know that correlation does not imply causality, right? High cholesterol in your blood does not give you heart attacks. There's some common mechanism there, but it is not the case that if you drop cholesterol, you will save someone from having a heart attack, right? And this is being played over again all right now because there's, well, all right. New York Times, every couple of weeks, there's a wonderful study. Okay, new drug, cut, cut, cut out amyloid plaques, and that will solve the problem of, of, of um, Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I predict it won't. That's, that's, that's uh, injecting causality, which does not exist, or, or, or a, a thing which is not causal, putting causality on it. So don't, so don't fall into that error. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about performance. Oh, I'd have to say one other thing, which is this. Um, C computer music in the 1970s was Pache George Lewis, largely a non-real-time activity. Um, there were a few people actually making real-time computer music. People like me were not, because we were um, concerned with something like generality, the sort of Eurocentric approach to computer music where you really want to be able to specify exactly what's going to happen. And that was not a thing that one could do in real time in the 70s. and and, and and have, have the result that one wanted. And so I saw it as my own quest in those days to change the role of the computer um, in music production from that of a studio tool to that of a real-time live tool. And that introduces interesting and boring questions. The questions that are boring, which I thought were interesting, were, well, how do you get that all to work? Like, you know, how do you make a real-time scheduler that uh, that, that actually turns a computer into a reactive thing that, that, that you can then craft into a musical instrument. The, uh, the interesting questions, which I didn't actually think of at the time, but which I uh, have, lear ha have come to think are interesting, and I can't say as a truth value that they really are, is that um, the, it's not the case that, I mean, well, this is obvious. A computer do isn't going to be an instrument like a banjo at all. In fact, you get to choose what aspects of banjo hood you want the computer to have and what aspects of it you don't want it to have. And that spins out in all kinds of wonderful ways, which are not things that anyone ever put down on anyone, as far as I can detect. Um, so the fact of the computer as being a thing which you can fashion into a real-time musical agent of one sort or another, be it a banjo or be it a, a, a fellow improviser or something else, um, that thing is something which is, which in fact was thrown into question by the uh, increasing availability of real-time computer music tools. And there, I guess I'm mentioning that because I want to, uh, prob at, at the risk of repeating myself a little bit, uh, go back and complain that uh, whenever you um, whenever you propose a computer music environment on someone, even though that environment is capable of doing, of, of allowing you to do anything at all, right? And if I could describe what Max and PD aimed to do, or what I aimed to do in trying to, to make Max and PD, it was to make the tool be absolutely transparent. C you know, c to absolutely put nothing whatsoever between the desires of the musician and the realization of the, of the computer music piece, right? That's why the screen is blank when you start out. Uh, um, uh, transparency, right? Wonderful goal. And yet, it doesn't come close to that because, you know, you, you make this tool that, 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 uh, that, you know, essentially rubs all the soot off of the window pane that you see, and then, of course, you see that there are other window panes that are still just as sooty, or, or um, that's a bad metaphor, but, you know, you know what I'm saying. That you you end up you end up having to question it on different levels, right? So the level on which I, you know, how would you be transparent? Well, the well the good way to do that obviously is to simply give the user a bunch of primitive user. That's all right, that's already a word that's not very transparent. Uh, so okay, you provide a bunch of primitives and then you just you know, you know tinker toy set, tr absolutely transparent. Except you know look at who look at what kinds of kids play with tinker toy sets and what kinds of kids don't bother to play with tinker toy sets. And then you will already see that you have unknowingly channeled yourself into a particular subset or a particular way of, of, of um, looking at the world of music, which, might, which certainly is not the only possible one that you could do. 
So the biases that I'm aware of, one are um, uh, Max and Petey hate studios and love the stage. <laughs> Right? Um, okay, I'm after promorphizing. They, they, they're, they're written with the stage in mind and not with the studio in mind. And therefore, they are very, well, they're as good as I was able to make them at solving or at permitting people to solve the, the sorts of problems that come up on, on stage. And they're kind of lousy things to confront in, in the office when you're computing that missile trajectory because there you really want to, or I'm sorry, uh, composing. Because, um, uh, because there you, uh, you just want something that works, you know? <laughs> and Max and PD are not just things that work somehow. Um, <laughs> you have to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so what I would suggest is that there, um, the pathways between what happens in your office and what happens on stage are regimented in, in a way in, in current usage, which I could caricature as being, you're doing programming kind of stuff in, in your office, which might me, mean making a patch or it might mean getting your digital audio workstation out and messing with it or you, you know what, all that, all that stuff you do on computers, read your email, surf the web. And then you get on stage and you know things are, and, and then what you do is you grab, you take your document, say hit save, take your laptop, move it over there, um, turn the lights on and then, and then and hook it up to the speakers and there's music coming out, right? However, the, the idea that you should sort of make a file in the studio, save it, and then, and then the, the file itself sort of takes care of some aspect of the live performance, that's a, that's a thing which you might, there might be openings there to, for different notions of how music might be made. All right, because, I mean, where did I get that idea? Well, I think I got that idea because uh, I was working in contexts which were composer-centric. Uh, so I was working in the MIT experimental music studio that was led by Barry Verko, a composer, and then I went off to IRCOM, which was run by Pierre Boulez, another composer. And so, of course, everything that I would have thought of would already have been conditioned by the idea that, oh, well, the way you make music is you, you get your pin out, and, you know, people didn't use finale. Get your pin out, make, put some stuff on paper, and that's the office work. And then there's this moment where you put this, the thing on the music stand, and then someone walks out on stage, lights go up, clap, clap, play it. Right? That's, that's not the only thing that could be out there. And in fact, that's a mode of making music that worked wonderfully in you know, the age of paper, but which we are now free to rethink in, a, in, a, in fundamental ways. And should, because, cool, well, maybe not clearly, but w one guesses that, or I guess, that the interesting stuff that's going, that one should do should be interesting in that it differs from what's happened in the past and of course the way you make stuff different is you start questioning stuff that people are maybe taking too much for granted. Okay, uh, thing, I, okay, yeah, so about more, somewhat more about office work. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, can I say, oh yeah, hmm, sorry. Trying to make a trying to make this make sense here. Um, actually, before I even jump onto office work, just one or two more things about the first aspect, which is the live aspect. Um, why would you? Okay, go back and ask the question. Why on earth would you do electronic music? Um, so I was not being completely forthright with you, or rather, maybe I was forgetting something important when I said, well, obviously the the answer is you could do anything that a speaker could emit. The other thing about it that somehow that doesn't capture is the fact that it's fun. Now, no one knows what fun is. Um, and another thing about that is that uh, no computer scientist uh, has, as far as I know, has ever actually come up with fun, being fun as a criterion for, um, for what to do with a computer or how to do it, right? And yet, it's pretty clear that if something isn't fun to do, it's not going to happen. Um, why? Because the way you learn how to do stuff is you start doing it because it's fun and then you get you know, hooked later. Um, so how do, you, how do you make something be fun? Well, making something be fun in the 80s is not the same thing as making something be fun now. Uh, but I can tell you that if you're doing, if you're making something and if it's not actually fun to use, you're, you should probably go back and rethink what it is you're doing. Now the 80s, the, the way I thought about it was this. Uh, fun is being able to walk out on, or 
you know, not me, but someone who, who actually can handle a musical instrument, walking out on stage and, and making cool sounds, right? That's, that, that's, that's an excellent idea about, you know, fun. Um, how would you, oh, and so the fact that the fun happens on stage, you know, the, 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 the office work, that's not fun, right? Um, and so th the way I th have thought about things in the past is sort of deprivileged office work because it's not going to be fun anyway in order to sort of concentrate the interesting part as being the, the onstage thing. And yet, at this point, I think, that the, I think that other people besides me are actually figuring out how to make software itself more inherently fun to use. And that is a thing which you should take into account when you're thinking about what you're going to do, I think if you're gonna to make tools for doing computer music, which is of course a whole other assumption which I probably probably shouldn't be making. All right, so that's, um, yeah, so, okay, I better, I better stop there about that because there, there's more, but I don't know how to say it. Um, biases of my own, let me just tell you things that are my biases. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I think that you can escape from my biases and, well, what I'm trying to say is this. If, I'm, if, I, if I can tell you what my biases are, then you can do something different from that. And then um, uh, that will be interesting to me because I already know what, what I can do and I'd like to see what you can do. <laughs> That's one way of saying it. Um, okay, so um, one thing that, uh, going back to the question of what's going to be the role of electronics in, um, in computer music, uh, my answer has always been, oh, the computer is a, uh, is a thing uh, of which you can, f or out of which you can fashion a musical instrument. And to me, the, um, uh, there, there is this, there's this sort of central mystery about music, which is, the, which is basically how time moves when you're, when you're making music. Um, the conservatory training actually can get composers and performers to the point where they can look at a score and somehow mentally get uh, bridge the relationship between what that score says on paper, which is which doesn't have time in it at all, and what a thing would actually sound like if you did it in time. But of course, historically, the way people found music uh, was not by writing it down; it was by performing it. And uh, both uh, both performers and uh, well, especially I think uh, performers of, of non-written musics uh, realized that you know um, there's a whole aspect to music for which the uh, the score is merely an encoding, a, a mnemonic, a way of memory, uh, of remembering, a way of not of losing things. Whereas the interesting thing that is happening is um, is something which happens in real time, which you can only learn by practicing it in real time, uh, and which. Uh, yeah, and which only and which only conservatory trained composers are actually able to create on paper. So, uh, one uh, so a bias of mine is that it is it is interesting actually to separate the notion of of, of paper composition from the notion of, of making music, uh, which is a thing which you, in my mind, can't capture all of. You can capture certain aspects of it in, in the way we write scores, but that might miss a much larger aspect of what it is to to perform something live. Um, so. So interesting directions, from my point of view, would be um, what what could what uh, what could you do as a music performer that you can't do with your banjo? And the answers might be things like this. Well, if you know how, if you if you have the technique for playing a musical instrument, that's a possible controller. For instance, the voice, if you can sing, is a uh, is a thing which Max Matthews observed uh, get, gives you a better. A faster bit stream than almost anything else that your body can do. It, you know, the other thing is your fingertips, of course. Um, there's a there's a wonderful ten dimensional joystick there that uh, that you could use to control anything that you could imagine if you could figure out how to do it. All you'd have to do is get the mic real close to your mouth so that you didn't sort of deafen the the sound of the speakers with your own voice, and and then analyze what was analyze or somehow process what's coming out the microphone, and then you could turn your voice as a singer into anything that you could conceive of. Maybe I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, in fact, that's the thing I'm working on right now with uh, with Juliana Snapper, uh, trying to figure out cool ways to make the computer into a filter for the voice that would actually give Juliana access to a whole different voice that that would feel like her singing it, but would sound like something else. That's a that's an interesting. It's probably impossible to do it well, but that's an or rather I probably won't do it well. Someone else will probably figure this one out, but uh, that's an interesting uh, challenge, I think. Um, so hijacking existing instruments, of which the most interesting one would be the voice, but, uh, but partial results might be if you can do things with, with um, things that you 
percuss or things that you twang that don't make too much noise by themselves so that you can hijack it and, and, and make the computer do stuff with it. That, that's an, that I think is an interesting uh, set of possibilities. That's not to say that other interesting possibilities are less interesting, such as, for instance, building stuff, right? So another thing that people have always done since the beginning of time probably is, is design new musical instruments with new hardware interfaces or new, new aspects of hardware. And of course, the computer is the ideal tool for in enabling people to make new musical instruments because you know the input can be just about anything and the output can be just about anything else. And you don't have to worry about making the interface actually be the thing that makes the sound. It just has to be the thing that, that, that moves the information. Right. Um, so I would argue that, at least from my uh, from my point of view, that that aspect of, of sort of instrument I instrument building by computer is is still a thing which we, which is in its infancy, and the things that stand between us and it are no longer the lack of a software environment that would allow you to do it, because we do have software environments now that would permit that, but is rather a a lack of of Either, either it's that the opportunity isn't there because I'm imagining something that doesn't exist, or it's that we haven't yet imagined the, um, the most interesting or the most fruitful ways that, that musical instruments could act now that we've freed uh, musical instruments completely from the physical constraints that, that they had to obey uh, before the electronic age. All right. Um, okay, well, that was a conclusion. I'm going to save the other conclusions for when I have to actually conclude. Um, and what I should do now. Okay, so we are now at the at the titular end of the talk, but I'm going to threaten to move to run about 10 minutes over and just abbreviate it by 10. And meanwhile, I'm going to leave time for questions. So, um, thing that I don't know anything about uh, to go back to this is what to do about the office work aspect of computer music. And there are interesting. What are the interesting questions about that? Okay, first off, it's not. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to come up with an environment answer to that. But there are other levels on which we lack, um, not lack, but there are other uh, levels on which interesting things could be done, I think. Um, one is, um, uh, one is at, at essentially, um, well, one is simply the, the, the idea of doing things at different levels. So that means to me, most interestingly, one is, is what are the things which could be interesting primitive operations that you could do that are not oscillators or filters, right? They're, you know, oscillators and filters are things that existed in the 50s, and of course, things like Max and PD and Super Collider code those into computer objects, but there must be other stuff out there that we simply haven't thought about because you wouldn't have been able to do them with transistors, and so they haven't existed yet, and, and now you could do them, and so why not? I mean, the set of algorithms is huge, and, and a lot of them would make noise if you sonified the result. All of them would, maybe. Um, and the other thing about, the other thing that isn't known is at, at maybe a higher level, what are the interesting algorithms? What are the interesting relationships between, um, well, what are the interesting spaces by which a, a, a live control stream or even just a file could translate itself into sound, right? And this, this touches perhaps back on the question of, of the uh, computer program as filter, you know, as thing which takes your possible one megabit of input and turns it into music. Um, wh what are the interesting transformations that you could put there? And in my time, the answer was, well, that's what the environment does. The environment takes your bit input and turns it into sound. But that is no longer true, because now the, mm, well, we've sort of barked up that tree long enough. But now what you can think is, well, we just don't even really understand what to do with those environments. In other words, there are possibilities out there which are algorithmic possibilities, which, you know, the, the, the environments all can carry out algorithms, you know, can all realize algorithms, some, some better than others. Um, and what's really perhaps wide open still is um, can you think of another interesting algorithm which creates an, an interesting variety of sounds with a, some, some suitably low dimensional set of inputs so that it can be a thing which, which expands a, a control stream in some way. And one detail about that, which I probably shouldn't say but, but will, uh, one thing that you should think about carefully if you're thinking about algorithms is pitch. Uh, time's easy. You should just, well, time's not easy. Time is, time is a thing which computers just don't understand, and so it's best left to humans, I think. Um, pitch is a thing which both humans and computers can mess with, and yet they have different ways of messing with them. And that, to me, is, uh, the, my way of thinking about that at the moment is the following. Um, you can, 
you can specify the, with just using a violin, you can specify a pitch to the violin uh, to, I don't know, three, de three decimal places of accuracy, right? And yet, you can't actually send an impulse out, you can't send an impulse down this nerve with that kind of accuracy at all. Somewhere there's an accuracy amplifier in the circuit that consists of you and the violin. If you just think of it in terms of, of you're creating information and now we're going to, uh, to make some sort of memoryless map that then turns that into a pitch, which will, which will have three, de uh, three degrees of precision, that's not going to work because obviously I can, make, I can move this hand to one digit of precision, this to another, and then my head to a third, and that could specify a three digit number, but that would not be a good way to specify pitch, right? The way, the way it works in the violin is that you become part of a, of, of a feedback loop and you don't actually specify the pitch at, at instant by instant. You, you scoop over to the pitch and then, and then get it and then do whatever correction you need to do so that, you, so that the person who's listening to it agrees that it's the right pitch. And in fact, if you measured it with a pitch tracker, it's doing a little bit of this stuff before it, uh, before it gets there, right? So pitch is an interesting thing. In fact, it's interesting in that it c casts into, f into full relief the fact that the information stream that you put into a, in, into a musical instrument is not uh, unidirectional at all. In to the point that if you ever actually were able to cut the violin player off from the violin and measure the information stream that went across from the one to the other and then reproduce that exactly, perhaps even with the same violin, you wouldn't get the same sound out, I don't think. In other words, the, um, I can't do the experiment, so I don't really know, but um, what, what you couldn't actually find out what the violin player was doing to play the violin by any possible process of looking at that information stream because it doesn't actually even contain the answer in the sense that it doesn't contain a, a sufficient information to tell the violin really what you want it to do because it, it misses the feedback and, the feed and it doesn't represent the, the whole of what's going on. That, I think, is something that needs careful thought and doesn't have a single answer by any means. There's, there's, no, I mean, there's no body of knowledge that will ever attain that will tell us how that all works, right? It's a fallacy to say that we'll ever actually explain any of this stuff, right? We, we, we can elucidate aspects of it, but we'll never actually understand it. We'll have to replicate it, forget it. Um, but, um, but that's the thing to think about in, in, in the way that you design a computer music instrument, because if you can do something that acts in some way uh, rem uh, correspondingly or, or similarly, or, you know, I don't know what you say, you're going to have to get that same kind of, of activity going between you and the computer if, you, if, if, again, you wanted to do things at the level of accuracy that you would need in order to specify a pitch with a human input, which to me is an important thing to be able to do. Okay, and my answer to that so far has just been, well, just rely on the existing instrument, but on the other hand, someone else who's smarter than me might want to actually think about that as an abstract problem and really get to where you can make a pitch stream as a human, get it into a computer without having to use a guitar or a voice uh, between the two of them, which, um, which is cheating in a way. <laughs> but of course I'm cheating because that's what I'm thinking about doing. Okay, so the, the third thing that, I, uh, yeah, real fast. The third thing I want to talk about is, is this question of, of um, either interoperability or, um, or of modularity or of uh, solidity in time, if that's the right word, uh, perenniality. In other words, how, how do you get it to where the thing that you're doing with the computer is a thing that you, that you can count on being what it is? <laughs> That's to say, if, if you go and, and do a piece on, if you go and do a piece on a 4X, um, which is the thing that they had at EarCom in the 80s, uh, that piece doesn't work anymore. Uh, the 4X was not a thing which, which uh, encouraged people to make modular software solutions for it. And in fact, I, I say software very easily because I, I think in terms of software, but that's my own training. It's, it's the modularity itself is missing. That's to say, the idea that everything that it does has a, has a well-separated specific function that we could drop another thing into that had the same function and get the same result in the same way as you can switch violins and, and still play the piece of music. Com uh, computer music practice has not yet uh, attained that ideal by any means. Although it's, it's, it's one that people are, are thinking about hard enough that, um, that you can sort of get ideas by looking around at what people are doing to try to, to get there. And one aspect of that is, um, is 
again, environments are probably not the answer. If you make a big software environment, one of two things will happen. One is it'll go the way of C sound or PD and just become QWERTYized. The other is it'll go the way of, of um, I'm trying to think of a dead one. I can only think of the live ones, but, um, uh, well, na name your favorite uh, thing that came out of a music store. Um, what is it now? What's the one that goes with Macs that, that, that people use in clubs? Ableton, yeah, go, go get Ableton. Um, or go get Max for that matter, and um, and make and realize something. Better yet, realize something that, that depends on both of them. <laughs> and you, that's a recipe for not being able to access your own music in five years. Uh, by access, I mean be be able to play again, not just be able to listen to a recording of. Which you know, that, so you record it, and that's that's a thing. But what you would really like to be able to do is 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 have a library of things that you can do with your computer that uh, that you can lean on. And a way to do that is not to rely on commercial software because it's, it's no fault of the people making the commercial software. They are under pressure to add features to their thing because they have to sell it. And you, you sell the next version by adding a bunch more features. And then the thing grows and the way software dies is like dinosaurs. It grows until it can't walk anymore and then it, you know, and then it fails, right? And so that you all are in, good, in a good position to you're in a good niche in some way because you're not stuck in the software industry. You don't have to make stuff that's going to die. You can make stuff that can stay small and, 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 and flexible and pluggable. And by pluggable, I mean uh, something that you can recompile to operate within, say, Ableton or Max or PD or Super Collider. If you can do that, then whatever it is that you made is, is going to last for a while. Uh, and, and yeah, and write it in a, in a programming language that's nice and, and QWERTYized too, like C, for instance. Um, yeah, and one last thing about that. No one's actually, I don't know if this thought actually sticks with the rest of it, but I should tell you this. No one's actually made a programming language for computer music that I'm aware of. I, well, Super Collider sort of. I mean, it is a programming language, but it's not a programming language in the sense of, oh, uh, is, there a, uh, is there a Super Collider program that does a quick sort? And can I get it as a library? In other words, it hasn't yet, it, it hasn't made it to the level of interchangeability of, of parts that say the C programming language has. And people have, pro have proposed programming languages for computer music many times. Uh, so, well, you know, C sound, Nyquist, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that none of them approaches, uh, none of them manages both to stay alive and also to get the universality of, of, um, of application space that you need in order to, to really make it as a programming language. Um, that's the thing that I think to think about is what, what that means is that um, either some brilliant person is going to come up with one maybe someday or that what we're doing is we're always stuck uh, writing computer music modules in other programming languages and what is a good methodology then for taking any existing good solid programming language like what C and making it so that you can just tell C what you want it to do as a computer music entity. To me what that means is tell is make a C program that knows how it's going to react to changing uh, conditions in a, in a possibly real-time context. Um, C is not very good at doing that, and if you want proof of that, look at what you have to do to write a PD object. It's 90% weird glue that has nothing to do with what you're trying to do. Um, and as far as I know, no one has come up with a programming methodology that allows you to, to be in a, in a standard programming language and still uh, have the sort of freedom and flexibility to describe processes that are typical of real-time uh, interact, well, reactive kinds of processes. I, I haven't seen it, so that's, a, that's another sort of dare I'll throw out to whoever wants to try to take it. Uh, and at this point, I, what I want to do is just stop and see if there are questions or, or disagreements or diatribes or whatever, <laughs> Miss, missiles, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>